Zooming in on music. Hello, this is Michael Giele, viola player in the Concertgebouw Orchestra and artistic director of Music Stages. This is the fifth edition of my podcast where I speak to awesome people in the music world. And one of the most awesome people I have known in my life has been Lucy Horse. Welcome, Lucy. When I asked her about doing this, Lucy said, do you want me to play something? I said, sure. So there you go. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Bravo. You've been, you've been stealing from the violins. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I did it on purpose. I thought you would recognize this. <laughs> so, um, Lucy is, like I said before, a wonderful person. Uh, Lucy is so brilliant in so many ways. Uh, you speak uh, German and French and Dutch, of course, <laughs> and English, obviously. Do you speak any more languages than this? Um, I'm learning Italian. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, I, I give up on that. Uh, let's stick to English for now. You are you are incredibly bright person. You are obviously very very good looking, and you are very confident. You are actually um, for such a young person. You are really scary. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not in your peer group, of course, but if I'd known you 30 years ago, uh, I think I would have been totally, totally in awe of you and I, I would have found it very difficult to approach you. Uh, what is your, your experience? Do uh, young men find you scary? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe that's why my love life is no success. No, but I think... Uh, and luckily, I have great friends who are all very supportive. And so I, de I definitely don't have the feeling like that from them because they they know me very, for a very long time. So that's the, I'm very lucky to have very old friends. I think that's the that's always the, the best relationships to have are people who have been with you from the beginning, kind of. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You, you are certainly a, a very, very unusual person. I remember I once uh, visited your parents' house. You were... That was probably maybe 15 years ago or something. And that was an unforgettable scene for my, you, you won't remember it, I'm sure. Uh, so I entered the living room and uh, I, have to, I have to say maybe to the listeners that both uh, Lucy's parents are distinguished cellists. Uh, Gregor Horst is a solo cellist uh, in, in my orchestra and his wife is also is a wonderful cellist and her brother is a, is a very good vi uh, violinist. Your brother is older than you, isn't he? Uh, yes, four years old. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so there is these uh, four musical people, and I, I enter the living room, and at the same time, 
there, there was Kaspar, the, the violinist. He was practicing uh, Paganini in the living room while you were sitting at the, at the uh, kitchen table doing homework. I think your mother was uh, helping you while she was cooking and G Gregor was trying to have a conversation with me. And, and, <laughs> and, and another thing was that uh, Kaspar, who is also a very talented young person, he had built an incredible tower with Jenga. So there was this oh, huge that. construction of-, of, of wooden, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. always good at his children, yeah. So, uh, so th that's just a scene of your family life. Yeah, everything <laughs> happened in the living room. It was all everything uh, at the same time. Do you think this is normal? Well, that's the interesting part because, of course, as a child, you don't think about what's normal, what's not normal. You just grow up in the environment that you grow up in. So that's. But if I look back on it, I realize that. Yeah, of course, I, I never, I don't know if I would be, have been. Uh, a classical a classical musician if uh, I wouldn't have been introduced to music from such a young age and it was such a natural thing for me it felt so normal in a way that it was just part of the family part of what we were doing all in our own different way of course but um, but I in, in that sense I think I'm very lucky with with two parents because it, it has brought me so much music so that's yeah I'm very grateful for that. And what did the conversations uh, at dinner table, what were they about? Did you just speak about music or...? or uh... Yes, about music, about, of course, what we were doing in school, about... I was having a lot of hobbies already then, so about my ballet class and about my horse riding class and about, yeah, just normal things, I think, whatever was going on there in our lives. But a lot of the conversations were about music because it was the, the job of both of my parents, of course, so then, yeah. It, a lot of the conversations were about music. So like you said, the, the, the fact that both your parents are musicians had a big impact on, on your career choice, didn't it? Um, I think the fact that I started playing the recorder was influenced by that. But I don't know, the rest of, the rest of my, the course that I chose, I think is not, you can say that I followed the same path as my parents, because of course the recorder is a very, in a way, a very unusual instrument that also they didn't know a lot about. So that was interesting from my perspective, because I remember as a child, I already was very sure that I wanted to do something that was from myself. So I wanted, I didn't want to simply do the same thing as my parents or the same thing as my brother. I purposefully chose the recorder because I wanted to be uh, eigenwijs, as we say in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel pushed in any sense? Not with the choice of the recorder. They were very surprised with that, but they thought, okay, yeah, well, why not? Because that's a good starting instrument for a few years and then maybe she will move on to a different instrument. They were just like, let's see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out that the recorder actually has a lot more to offer than they, they knew. So different types of recorders, different repertoires. And then it just, yeah, it quickly became kind of my thing that I got so much joy from that they could see that. I did get a very strong sense of whatever I'm doing, I have to do it at... Um, I have to take it seriously. That was very much a message from my parents. But what it could have been a sport as well. It could have been art, drawing, whatever. Whatever I was doing, I was doing it seriously. That was kind of the... I just took their example, basically. Of, yeah. Would you say that music has dominated your, your childhood? I mean, was that the, 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 the main thing happening in your life? I mean, or... No. Uh, to be honest, actually not. That's that's the interesting thing. I never thought that I would end up being a musician. I still sometimes think like, <laughs> I'm sometimes I'm surprised that I'm still so passionate about it because I always expected that I would end up somewhere else or I would, I don't know, study at a university, a uh, different, follow a different course or become a doctor or whatever. Um, but that somehow I always, at different stages in my life, music always came back as being of such great importance and also playing concerts just became such a big passion that that in a way it, it seemed like I would be making my life miserable if I would be taking that away. So, yeah. Yeah. And But in the beginning, it wasn't the case. In the beginning, uh, I was just having different hobbies and it was just my recorder lesson every week. I was practicing every day as alongside all my other hobbies, which were reading and drawing and horse riding and ice skating and all those kind of things. In my own experience, when I was a teenager, let's say, uh, I was quite estranged from, from, from my peers, from other people uh, of my age, because 
I was just doing different things. I, music was so important, took such a big chunk out of my life and I wasn't very good at sport. So, so the combination of those two is very deadly when it comes to, co uh, to communicating with your peers. How did you experience that? Um, I did. I didn't. I always had a few very good friends from in the primary in primary school already. So I, but I always felt like I could talk about whatever was going on with all of us, and then we all had our separate like hobbies for outside of school. So it felt like I I could be part of the the group at school and then do my own thing at at um, when I came home. But of course, I I did notice in high school that there was a difference in in like the time time management so I, I couldn't just like stay at school and chill for four hours without planning ahead of like okay then I'm going to meet that person so that that's a difference that then I realized there was a difference in my kind of lifestyle mm. because of course if you go to school and you are till three or four o'clock uh, in school and then actually my day had to start still because I had to practice two instruments and do my homework and learn for for tests so I always kind of rushed home to get to the next thing, <laughs> to uh, get to all my, through all my tasks. Yeah. And, and you were quite brilliant at, uh, at all of it, which is so, so amazing. You mentioned the second instrument uh, for people who don't know, which is your second instrument? The piano. And how serious are you with the piano? Uh, quite serious in the sense that from the, the same thing, actually, as from the beginning, I took it very seriously and but I didn't have any expectations of what would become of the piano. It, it started as kind of a practical idea, like, oh, maybe it's good to do an extra instrument. It was actually my first recorder teacher at the music school who recommended me starting to learn the, the piano. And then I had a fantastic teacher, Maries Benoit, who motivated me to also apply for this Swaling Academy at the conservatory. And then I was admitted for both the recorder and the piano. So then kind of this combination thing started because then actually I had to do it in, in equal on an equal level uh, and then I was admitted to the class of Jan Wijn so of course a certain level is yeah. expected <laughs> for that so I basically had to just do all the exams that all the other students have to do because it's a it's a main subject study so yeah but of course I have a little I have a bit less time to practice so sometimes I have to kind of still I still struggle with that sometimes and do you also perform on the piano because uh, I've been lucky to to hear you performing on the recorder but i've actually never heard you play the piano no i don't play a lot of concerts with the piano also because i didn't have i didn't really want that in the beginning because i didn't i just didn't feel the need to to play concerts or, or have kind of a career ambition because i already had stress from like all the different things that come into play when you have a career um with the recorder so i thought uh, piano is just my own thing in a way, so it was just my passion. But now, actually, I'm starting to open up to the idea of playing more more concerts, and and it's it might be happening. I'm playing together with a singer now, uh, so that was a nice kind of Corona collaboration because we both were basically at home doing nothing, and then we started playing together, and now we've kind of built up this this collaboration. So maybe that will turn into something. And also piano, I love to do chamber music because that's something that's with a recorder. You are often if you play with other if you work together with other musicians, it's often in a kind of solistic role because you are obviously most often the, the highest instrument of the of the group. Um, so what I like very much is to have like the supportive role for once with the piano in, in a group, in a chamber music group or with a singer to, to really follow everything and to accompany in, in a way. You told me once that you were also taking singing lessons. Is that still the case? Yes, that's my uh, third instrument. <laughs> yes, yes. Most people struggle uh, managing just one, and and uh, well, you do three. But I wouldn't. I mean, I don't recommend it. It's it's a lot of fun, but it's also it also leads to a lot of of just yeah struggles of of managing time and trying to. But I guess that's all, it's in a way it's always the case that you would want to practice more. Even people who do who play one instrument, they always feel like they're not doing enough. So I have that same feeling. But <laughs> but of, on three instruments, several instruments, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as long as it and and it's also important to realize that the reason that I still enjoy all three is because I'm doing all three. I think it's it's really that's in a way luxury of playing several instruments. That if I don't feel like playing the recorder one day, I just start with my piano practice and then I can. If I don't feel like playing Bach, I start with my Scriabin. 
and then I can switch to. So I really like this variety. But it certainly takes up uh, most of your day, doesn't it? Yes, but I don't, I'm, I can practice quite efficiently, I think. I mean, that sounds very, but it, it's just out of necessity that I've learned how to practice in a short amount of time, I can make progress. And then I also realized that I shouldn't overdo it because if I have to keep my kind of inspiration and then I'm, I can progress very quickly, but if I don't feel inspired or, or motivated or it just doesn't work, then it's better to realize that and yeah, take it easy. Yeah. When I spoke to you briefly uh, prior to this uh, recorded session, you told me that you were performing last week and that that made you really happy. I mean, it's yes. totally obvious that you are a born performer. So what does it do to you? What does it mean to you to perform? It means it's kind of my way of self-expression, I would say. So, so connecting with an audience and um, also the feeling of a live concert experience that it has to happen in the moment and you're able to react to what the other players are doing and kind of create an atmosphere. That's, that's what I find so that's what I still find so interesting about playing concerts, that it's, that it's all about the moment and you have to find a balance between like preparing very well and um, knowing what, what message you want to communicate with the music. But at the same time, in the moment itself, you have to let go and you have to surrender to what's happening. So that's a very, I, I find it a very inspiring feeling. I mean, for your age, you are really a seasoned veteran performer. You have, uh... Play, been playing concerts all your life, I guess, but uh, especially in recent years, you have also done international travel, you have performed in Japan and all over the place, basically. So, so you are you actually next to your study, you have been quite busy already uh, giving concerts all over all over the world. So, yeah, I'm very lucky with that. I well, don't like traveling not just well, lucky, you're very good. <laughs> so people love to hear you play. Uh, but uh, now, now in these uh, strange times, uh, how has it been for you? Um, I I have to say in the beginning it was like a few months of disappointment because of course I was still hoping maybe this will go through, maybe this will go through, and then everything got cancelled. All the and also the travels, especially with you mentally so of course forward to going to a certain country or to or to perform the piece that you've been on for months uh, on a period it became more i became more used to the idea of just expecting nothing to happen and only be glad being glad if something can uh, go through so I've, I've been kind of working on my mental state to be more to accept the uncertainty of, of this time. So, so I guess now I'm, I'm better than I was in the beginning. Yeah. Well, I mean, for somebody with such energy and such focus, it must have been a real challenge because you can, if, if you are able, physically and mentally able to do all those things and be so focused and concentrated and then not being allowed or not being, being able to do it because of this uh, pandemic, it, it must have hit home quite hard, didn't it? I have to say also, I, I noticed a lot of, I learned a lot of things about myself that I do sometimes let my, how do you say that, my identity depend on what with my, with my life or something. And that's, that's not always healthy. So I also realized that if my self-confidence, nothing wrong with my self-image. So that's, yeah, that's an interesting kind of, Thing to to become conscious about yeah and there is also something else anyway in, in my experience i i found that i only even fathom to understand uh music once i perform it you can practice as much as you like and you can study and you can read books but this actual experience of being out there and playing it and this interaction with, with the public, that is crucial. Uh, you, you don't really know a piece un until you've played it, I don't know, a few times at least, uh, preferably more yeah. uh, in, in front of a public. How, yeah, how that's, that's very true. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree very much with that, especially with contemporary music. I still have that feeling that I can prepare all the notes, I can practice all the different, I can learn all the orchestral parts, but you, because it's more difficult to imagine how the music sounds, that's probably one of the one of the reasons, but especially with contemporary music, you need that live experience before you can really understand. And it's true that actually only after you've played it a few times in different acoustics in different situations, then you get closer to like the essence of the music. Especially for you, because on the recorder, you have basically two repertoire choices. You play Baroque music or Renaissance music, or you play modern music. With modern music, I think that is very true that you can only really judge a piece or really understand a piece once uh, it's been played a lot. Many people have, have the tendency to hear a piece for the first time or play a piece for the first time and then they think, oh, no, it's not good, I don't like it. But how, how can they tell? I mean, in Beethoven's time, uh, he, he got some terrible critics uh, for, for, for his writing. <laughs> And, and somehow yeah. time told us how to listen to this music. And, and quite frankly, some, some of the late Beethoven string quartets, as beautiful as they are, but if you hear it for the first time, you think, what the hell is going on here? So, well, so yeah. and of, of course, not everybody, not every modern composer is, is Beethoven or, or of that quality, but still, I think we can only do justice to, to, uh, to these modern pieces if we really, if we, We've really played them a lot. And yeah, I even last week when I was playing a, a program with a lot of pieces that I'd never played before. And they were all like from not, not really famous Baroque composers, Neapolitan composers. And then you realize that once you trust in the music and once you have to make it work in a way for because you're preparing for concerts and you're rehearsing with the, with the musicians, then you, yeah, then it gives you the motivation to really get everything from the music and to give everything to the music that you can and then suddenly it turns out to be brilliantly written and uh, very inspiring but it's only when you also give something to the music that the music can give something back to you so that's very uh, yeah when you listen to music do you have preferences i mean Let's be honest, not many people will uh, sit down at home, relax in an armchair and listen to a contemporary piece of music. Or are you different in that sense yeah. as well? No, I, I have to be honest, that's something that I still have to, maybe that I still have to discover, like the, the experience of just listening to, to a recording of a contemporary piece. Usually I want to see it as well, because, yeah. because often uh, in music instruments are used which are difficult to imagine so then it really helps i even notice it when i listen to Beethoven, like to hear it live because you can see which groups are contrasting the motives to to one another or um when something is happening in the winds i, I don't know it just adds another dimension for me so i'm not i have to train myself to listen more like just a pure auditive uh, music but i think yeah baroque music is probably more e easier to to um understand or to experience when you just listen to a recording but in, in in terms of preferences i think it varies a lot of course i listen to also piano music so mm. it's uh, there you have all the repertoire in the world of course the most beautiful music has been for for written for piano so uh, yes. yes well kind of yeah that's that's a never-ending journey to listen to all the all the piano repertoire that's true yeah but I listen to also, to be honest, if I try to relax, I, it's usually, it's not always classical music because then I get very much, I, I listen in a different way because of course it's our, maybe you have this as well, because it's our profession to listen yeah, yeah. critically in a way to ourselves. So then when we hear a recording in the background, I start listening to it very attentively. So then when I try to relax or I'm having drinks with friends, then it's always jazz music or or pop music or something yeah. lighter oh, I, i'm terrible if i if if i have to sit in a restaurant uh, with uh back, classical back, background music it's it's like hell <laughs> it's like i can't hear it loud enough i can't hear this who is playing what are they playing how are they doing <laughs> it <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah which recording which <laughs> yeah so in, in a way sometimes i i envy people who can just enjoy music without trying to analyze everything and without actually being being having the critical mind uh, on all the time also also 
when I'm playing myself, very often, I, I'm sure you have had the same experience after a concert, uh, people from the public, especially when they when they're not musicians, they come to you and they ask you, "How did it go?" And and I really, I always have to to sort of find find words to tell them uh, that I enjoyed it very much. While in my head, it was like this went wrong and that went wrong. This could be better. And <laughs> Bar one. <laughs> Never mind the concert, but what happened in... <laughs> That's why th there should always be this, this distinction between the audience should never ask the musicians what they thought themselves because they don't, you, 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 usually you don't want to know what the musician th is thinking about. Often also if, if people ask, what were you thinking about? What were you imagining? And then you were only worried about like your dress, something went wrong with the dress or you noticed that one of the players was out of tune or someone had to fix a string in between you you're only busy with those kind of things and then for the rest you try to of course focus on the music but it's not you don't have you don't picture like a landscape or um, at least i don't so it's not as mis mystical as people think but where does it come from i think that's a really interesting point i i remember once uh, speaking to to heinrich schiff He's a famous cellist. Unfortunately, he died, uh, I think, last year. And he told the student, and the student, he was like, oh, wallowing in the music. And he was like, re obviously, really very, very and, and, and uh, Heinrich Schiff did not like it. He said, it's not you who is supposed to enjoy the music. The public has to enjoy the music. So there is no point in, in wallowing. You have to, to, to stay, stay in control and make sure that you transport. We, we are... We are like uh, a vessel. We are we are carrying something between the composer and the uh, and the public, and and yeah. uh, that unfortunately doesn't necessarily uh, go along with enjoyment. Sometimes it does, but not by definition. I don't think. Yeah, no, that's very true. And also, I notice more and more that if the when I myself got listen to concerts, I find it very interesting that the more focused the per person is who is playing the music the more still and focused, the more still and focused the audience is yeah. as a consequence of that. So it's very much, if you yourself are very uh, like busy with all the, the technical difficulties or you are uh, distracted or something, then immediately the audience is also distracted and also is not focused on, on the music. So that's a very interesting, mm. yeah, so that's true. You have to, have to be in a way in control as a musician. Yeah. Yeah. You have, like I said at the beginning, you have been very, very successful. I mean, you are, how old are you now? 24 or something? Oh. 21. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. You, you look you look 17, but uh, okay, you're 21. So you oh, are... no, no. I, I guess it's a compliment because I don't feel <laughs> yeah. sure yet, but yeah. So you're 21, but you have a professional international management. You have a recording contract. Uh, you do international tours. Uh, it's incredible what uh, what you have uh, achieved uh, at such an early age. Uh, I, I want to single out two things because they they spring to my mind. Uh, they really stick out. Uh, one is that you won last year, I think, the Netherlands uh, Music Prize. That's the national, uh, the na national prize for for music. That in itself is not a surprise because you're just one of the great young or great Dutch performers, young or not. That wouldn't come as a surprise. But what really surprised me was the speech that you gave when you got the prize. You, I, I, I listened to it. It was in the in the in the music bow. What was your what was your statement in that speech? So yeah, so I have to explain the context because it was Corona time when I received the prize officially. Of course, I knew longer beforehand that I would be awarded the prize, but the prize ceremony was taking place in Corona time when all of musical of the musical uh, society in the Netherlands was basically sitting at home without doing anything because they weren't allowed to. So I felt that I had to had to say something critical about the situation and not just say, well, thank you for the prize and everything's going great, you know, because it, it wasn't also for me, I had been sitting at home for, for two months. So it felt very contradictory to receive a prize, which is such a positive thing, of course, but then at the same time, 
we don't all feel very optimistic about the future of, of the music world in, in this time, especially. So I felt I had to say something about that. And, and my message was also about the Dutch policy because um, I was playing, performing there at that prize ceremony concert together with the orchestra of the 18th century and Capella Amsterdam, the choir. And both of those organizations had just heard literally two days before this prize ceremony was taking place that uh, they didn't get subsidy from the, from the government, like the big subsidy that they give to different cultural uh, institutions here. They, they didn't get it despite a positive judgment. So they were judged positively, but there just wasn't enough money. So they didn't get any access. I, I believe that this has been partly corrected for, for both ensembles uh, in recent months. So, so I think that they do receive some, yes. some subsidy yes, after all. That, that's, of course, uh, very, very empathetic of you and, and, and very good of you. That you but you said something else, uh, which really, I thought, wow, wow. For, for a person of such a young age, uh, you said something about the, the basis on which these grants are given. You said that, that there was not enough appreciation for, for tradition and that uh, sometimes it, it felt like the Dutch cultural policy was kind of hyperventilating and, and just going after, after gimmicks or after, after well, things because they were new and hip and, and, and there was not enough appreciation for, for real quality, for real value. And I thought it was a very, very mature and, and very bold statement. And I hope that some politicians listen to you. Yeah. yeah, the Minister of Culture was there, but I don't know if this speech actually had consequences for the for the policy. I don't I, I would hope so. But that was also one of the reasons why I felt a bit doubtful before giving a speech, because I was I didn't want it to sound like a, like I was looking for attention or something, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. if it's. Like why was it even having a speech as a musician? You always feel like you just have to. Your job is just to play, and not to to be a politician and to speech about things. But this, in this case, I did feel the need to kind of use my words because sometimes that's also what I said in my speech. Sometimes it turns out that just the performance is not enough because it just the message doesn't reach the the people who should be listening to it. So then you have to be more explicit and put it into words. Mm. I, guess. I, I think that you were very brave and, and I, uh, although I admired you already before, but that, that gave me even more reason because it, it was so, so mature and it was very, very like honest, you know, like you really care, care about the music and, and, uh, and I don't think we musicians should just shut up and play. I, I think sometimes we we have to use the platforms and you were given a platform and you used it well. So so uh, really, really my, my compliments on that. Yeah, I think we all have a, have a very different perspective and I felt like I have to say something on behalf of the musicians because I am, of course, I we are all belonging to a very, in a way, a very in, in general, a very vulnerable group of society, I think. Musicians are generally not, at least in Holland, they're not very... They don't have a high social uh, status. Yeah. Yeah. The other, uh, the other achievement that you had is of a very different sort. Uh, that was okay. the interaction on YouTube with the two Asian Australian violinists called uh, the infamous. That was also a Corona project, actually, yeah, yeah. because I never would have time to make this video and to edit everything and to I actually my brother helped me so Kaspar did all the editing work because yeah, I, yeah. he knows I, how this work yeah yeah I, I I will put the links down in this video because it's just so brilliant so to explain <laughs> quickly two set violin is a set of uh two Asian Australian violinists and they somehow uh with a lot of humor and 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 a lot of sense of fun they they uh they expose the, the, the strange things, the oddities of a musician's life. And, and, yes. and uh, I mean, they're unbelievably funny. And, and uh, yes, I have- I'm very big fan of them. Yeah. And uh, at some point they decided to do uh, a video proving that the recorder was not a real instrument. 
And then our Lucy Horse, uh, she she made this recording, uh, reacting to that video, and it was picked up by them, and they they appreciate yeah. so you became uh, so cool. So then they even made a reaction video to my reaction video, yeah, yeah. which was really flat because I thought they would just like leave it leave yeah, it at yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I thought that was that was really sweet of them, very very uh, professional and ve very nice, and uh, it, yeah. it brought you YouTube fame. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I cool. had the the the. I was in Corsica uh, this summer. It was the only international thing which I was able to do um, mm. at the festival. And there was one violinist who came. Uh, he was part of the academy there, and he came there. I was on this island in the middle of nowhere, and there was a violinist who came to me and who said, "Aren't you that girl from the two set violin?" uh video and then i was wow this is really i had never had this kind of reaction from someone in a different part of the world which has knows you only from a youtube video so that yeah, was yeah. very surreal because yeah. it really reached a lot of people i think because yeah. of course they are very very popular they have a lot of followers and quite justly because they are unbelievably funny so and and yes, sometimes i i find that that uh, musicians take themselves too seriously so, and, and yeah. they, they found a good way of bringing humor and, and uh, this kind of smile into, into classical music, which we sorely need, especially in, in times like this. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. I mean, this Corona crisis, crisis brought about a huge, huge growth in activities online. Have you, apart from, from that uh, interaction with the two set violin, have you engaged in uh, similar similar things? Have you tried to to explore the World Wide Web and reach out to people on 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 that forum? I did in the beginning of Corona when literally I was like sitting inside for three months or something. Um, I did use my social media a lot more because I noticed that that was my only way to reach people because I used to think it as like an ex bonus extra to my life as a professional musician of playing concerts but then i realized actually this is my only way to communicate still with music lovers or music fans um so i did make some videos just inspired by things that i was very spontaneously thinking of so for example i made an herbarmody video of with which i used for the first time like a split screen so i had time to like more time to invest in my social media things and I thought of making videos that would just make people happy or at least give them like a distraction so that I did realize that social media is uh, can be of much more importance than I gave it, uh, to it before corona started so I, I I'm grateful for having those pages and having those followers now did you also watch more of things on YouTube and Facebook than before or or was it mainly uh, output uh, Yes, no, I did watch. I did watch, uh, for example, um, now I forgot his name, but the violinist who recorded himself playing the piano and like uh, playing on a keyboard, yeah, um, yeah. accompanying himself and playing like a Beethoven sonata or a lot of repertoire he did, he did uh, accompanying himself that I watched a few of his videos. I think he started his YouTube channel also. He brought out a lot of videos during Corona time. Um, and some other, yeah, some other channels as well. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, I had more time to indulge in uh, in watching videos of other people as well. Yeah. One of my favorites is is also somebody that I I've known uh, for for many many years. It's uh, she's called Malin. She's Swedish uh, and she lives in Stockholm and she's concertmaster I think in the radio orchestra there. And she recorded uh, the Mendelssohn Octet all by herself. Because she can not only oh, play, wow. she's not she can not only play the violin, but she's also obviously a very good violin. Oh, I, think she, I think my family members showed it to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Marlin, really she's, impressive. She's a miracle. You remind me of her in that sense. Yeah. Just too too much talent to to to, uh, to grasp. I don't know. I don't know about that. I still have to learn string instruments because I've never, <laughs> I don't know how to play. That's also, I started in Corona time. I had a few cello lessons with my parents, <laughs> my first cello lessons. <laughs> These are more of fun things, of course, but uh, how much depth can we give to 
an online performance? Because obviously there is something very important missing and that's the direct yeah. response of our, our public. So, yeah. so how, how do you feel about that? Can, can we explore methods or ways to expand the possibilities of, of, uh, of the internet? For, for for our music i'm not sure as long as there's um maybe maybe there are ways to to expand the connection for the listener but i think for the musician as long as we play in front of a camera it just feels like a camera it will never feel like there's really because it's it's a thing of yeah it's very difficult to explain but you feel the energy of someone who's actually like a living person who is sitting in the hall, even if it's just one person, they determine the energy that comes back to you. And you somehow you feel that. That's what I noticed when I played the short concert last last week for all different audiences. So there were 30 people and then the next group came in, came in it was 30 different people. And there was such a clear distinction between the group dynamic of one group of people who didn't even know each other. But th there was just such a clear difference in, in the atmosphere that the audience brought to the performance. So then you really, really realize that that's such a, an important part of the performance. So I don't think we can recreate that with with an online performance. That's also why I was a bit cautious of if I would play something, it would have been more uh, like a video recording of something in my living room. But to to actually do a concert for for your social media fans, I don't know if that's the same. We can offer more like background information maybe or more... Um, like an in-depth, more personal approach to music. So showing like the leading up to the performance or those kind of things. I think that's something that um, social media platforms can definitely add something to, to give people insight in that, in that aspect. I, I think what can help, uh, I've experienced that a little bit, uh, is when, when the Concertgebouw Orchestra, they were, they were releasing some, some old, old recordings and some musicians did some short introductions uh, in, before, uh, before the recordings. I did one of them. Uh, it was on, on Bruckner's Fifth Symphony with Hanan Kur. And then while it was aired, this, this recording, I was live on YouTube and I was watching the, the commentaries of people. And then at some point I started uh, also saying things. And in a, in a strange way, that was really... I mean, obviously it wasn't the same, but but it was still, it felt like, yeah, but you're doing it for people. You, the, uh, and it, it was a way of, there was a person in Thailand and there was a person, in, I, I don't know, in, in, in all, all parts of the world, which is, so maybe where we should be just a little more patient and, and keep exploring, because maybe there are ways to connect with our public, but this, yeah. but this, energy that you're talking about is, is really essential for the performance of, of music. I, I agree. Are, are you going to, to explore some more uh, opportunities online? Are you, are you, I mean, what does your recording company say? Are, are, you're with Deutsche Grammophon or some, one of the... Decca. Uh, with Decca, Decca yeah. yeah. So what are they saying uh, about it? Well, they, I remember when I first got uh, offered like when I was 16 they they signed me as a as a recording artist and then they already were talking about me maybe starting uh, like making YouTube videos mm -hmm. because they said that would be an interesting addition but then I was doubting if that was the thing that I wanted to because I just didn't feel that was my output and it was not something that I would be good at or I would have to train it for a very long time and and it would become my thing but I didn't feel comfortable of doing it. So actually they were very open to, to expanding that, but I was more in a way more conservative because I know that I can make a special, uh, I can create a special atmosphere when I'm on the stage and I'm kind of in control of that, but I don't feel like I have that same grip on uh, putting out videos on social media. So I'm a bit more careful with that. So a bit more self-conscious in a way because I, it's I'm still relatively inexperienced I mean even now I still think about my the text which I have to write for a post I'm like rethinking the sentence you know it's it's not it's not natural for me so then it didn't feel like it was something that I wanted to do on a, on a regular basis but maybe it will come 
maybe leading up to the next album or something i can get a behind the scenes my brother actually advised me to start uh, to start doing that to to kind of record what's all going on because it would be interesting for people to have an insight in what it actually is like the work that we're doing all day because i think it's sometimes a bit mysterious what musicians are doing in in a day <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I, I've spoken to to some colleagues uh, recently, and they said nowadays you almost cannot release a new album or a new uh, new piece of music without without background information. I think it's it's more and more becoming part of the of the package. Yeah. So uh, and and in a way, it's it can also be fun. Last week I spoke to Brett Dean, an Australian composer, and he told me about uh, some recording sessions that a great British viola player, Lawrence Power, was doing. And he was commissioning contemporary pieces of music and he produced them. I think he has his own production company and he produces them in uh, unusual settings. So it's that's not that's not just a gimmick like, oh, look, look, we play and I play something fancy. There is some, some real meaning in, in what he does. Quite possibly we have to think more along those lines so that it's not just, just okay, I'm alive and I can play. Thank yeah. you, you know that. But I'm producing something of value. I'm commissioning something, a piece of music for, from a contemporary composer and because he's such a great player and he, he knows everybody in the music world, he gets some great com commissions. So he recorded a piece by Salomon, for example, and, and others. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I think I've reached out to him. So I will also want to talk to him about this because I, I think that we should get past this stage of, of uh, hysterical, uh, I, I'm alive. Yeah, yeah. Just to me. Show yes. yeah. 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 So yeah, I agree. To have some more um, uh, depth. Yeah. 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 If we look ahead now, obviously we don't know how these things is is going to work out, but some vaccines are on the way, and hopefully, hopefully, concerts will be possible with more public in not too distant the future. Uh, how do you see your life, let's say, in half a year or in a year's time? What do you think? What's happening? Um, I think I will be thinking a lot because I, I realize that, that I very much enjoy um, exploring different possibilities. And sometimes when you lead a very busy life, that's difficult in a way because you are asked to do things. It was also, I think, the, a phase of my life in which you just have to kind of prove yourself still. So you are just doing whatever you're asked for and the, 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 the opportunities that you get, you are very grateful for and you have to use them to your, to your advantage. But I think now I'm entering into a phase of more people um, uh, asking me for things that I, I'm allowed to, to invent the whole program or to think of a collaboration myself or to do those kind of things. So I'm, I'm looking forward to being busy with that more and with the, with the, in, a, in a way the mental preparation or just thinking about interesting projects to do that maybe haven't been done before or exploring possibilities and challenging myself in that respect. Is, is there a particular project that you're busy with now that uh, that is new for you as well and where you, you are hoping to develop and grow as, a, as an artist? Well, I'm very interested in folk music at the moment. So I want to learn more about the the role that recorder has played in different folk cultures so that's something that i that i'm yeah that i'm busy with at the moment but now my research is just basically youtube like watching a lot of different videos and asking asking people for for advice but that's yeah that's something that i want to explore even more i mean a great person for that is uh lotta venakoski a finnish composer you you premiered a piece of hers and and uh, she knows a lot about folk music, so so I'm, I'm sure she, yes. she can give some. In speech, she used also Hungarian folk folk tunes, right? She she used a few uh, traditional yeah, yeah, yeah. tunes. But but she's also a folk music player herself. Have you, have you been in touch with her lately? Yes, a little bit. Yes, we've emailed back and forth because I played. A, um, she uh, was a long time ago. She studied with Louis Andriessen, mm -hmm. uh, the Dutch composer. 
and I sent her the recording of a of a piece which I played in the in a whole not festival by by Louis Andries. So and she's she's very nice. Yeah, we so we have some email contact still. Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to your uh, to your recording or YouTube video uh, playing <laughs> playing folk music. Uh, I actually I've been living in Holland for 28 years, but I wouldn't know what Dutch folk music is like. But uh, no, I said, either. yeah. Do you know? Do you have any idea? No, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. If you would have to single out one thing, what what are you the most passionate about in music? What 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 means the most to you? Um, that's a very good question. I think. Um, herkenning. Uh, like. Um, that Re you can rec recognize, recognize yourself in something but that also goes further like that the people who are listening to what I'm playing can somehow recognize something of their of themselves in the music or they can recognize some kind of past identity or uh, yeah that's 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 what I'm interested in because that's the the essence of communication like the music can touch people only when there's something in it that they can relate to or they can they can take away from it so that's yeah but it's not one word but that's i'm trying to explain the, the word which i'm trying to search yeah. for <laughs> yeah i think it's a very very beautiful uh, thing to say and and i actually when i see you perform i can i can totally relate to it i can i can see that that you're very much somebody who connects to not only to the music but also to public you you are the real a real vessel of, of music, it's uh, amazing. But let's say now, uh, if you weren't doing music, what would you be doing? I was thinking about this recently and I was in a bookstore and then I thought, okay, this is nice. I would like to work in a bookstore because it's always, always people who work in bookstores, if you ever come there, they're always friendly. They're always like interested in a lot of different subjects because basically the whole day they can just read or talk to customers about books um, or listen to podcasts or something like that. So maybe I would work in a bookstore or I would be maybe an artist in, in some other form, like maybe um, maybe a painter that that would seem like. A, or no, actually, I still want to also be a writer. So that's but that's that's not I can combine it with music, luckily. But that's something that I still hope to be someday. Well, it's obvious that communication is a real passion of yours. I'm I'm uh, very grateful that you took the time to to speak to me and to to talk about music. And uh, I'm happy if people get to know you a little bit, because uh, more from from inside. Because in my opinion, you are one of the great musical personalities that I've known in my life and, and I feel very privileged that that is the case. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I feel very uncomfortable with all the compliments. <laughs> but, uh, no, you deserve thanks. them, really, really. Bye. Bye, Michael. Zooming in on music.